for the Aggies event for energy. We have spent the entire weekend, and teams have spent the entire weekend, solving some of the problems that we see in the energy industry. So we have concentrated a number of students, over 60 students involved in 10 different teams, and you're gonna see their final presentations here. We'd like to welcome you to this. My name is Rodney Bain. I'm a professor of practice here at Texas A&M University, and proud to be able to offer this opportunity for you to see what's going on. Each team will have 10 minutes to present, then we will have five minutes of questions from the judges. After that, we'll go on to the next team. We'll take a short break after five teams, and then we'll continue on. At the very end, well, the judges and I will then retire, and we will make a choice between the first, second, and third place teams. First place team will be awarded $1,000. The second place team, $750, and, the five, and $500 to the third place team. We'll hand out big checks. Students, I want to tell you, those checks are not cashable. All right? So I want them back. So we'll show, we'll, we'll show you how we're going to do all of that. All right? I also want to let you know that we are responsible for engineering entrepreneurship. So if you'd like to continue on with your project, we want to encourage you, and we will get you involved in engineering entrepreneurship and put you straight into our incubator. We've had patents. We've had startups. We've had a number of things come out of an Aggies event. This is the 34th time that we have offered an Aggies event, and we do this three times a semester. So again, I think for all of you here in the audience and those of you watching online, you're going to have a tremendous treat. We have a distinct panel of judges here right now, and with the judges, I'd like them to introduce themselves. And judges, I'll remind you to turn on the microphone uh, so that we can hear you as you introduce yourself. Let's start over here. Jeremy Ferguson, BP. Yes, Sam Rogers, BP. Howdy, John Fry with Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Novo Morita from uh, Jamaica, Texas a and I'm Greg Small with Accenture. And I'm Cameron Medlin with Accenture. All right. As you can see, we have a tremendous panel of judges here. And students, you have quite, quite the task in front of you. Remind you, 10 minutes. And let's get started with the first team, FlameX. So FlameX, if y'all will come right on up here. Here's the clicker. And we are ready for your presentation. Howdy, we're Team Flamix from Aggie Invent, and we're here to find energy solutions. I am Safe Samnani. My name is Nandan Chedagon. I'm Haley Havel. I'm Saida Spinoza. And I'm Phoebe Hostone. So for our main agenda, we have four different uh, things we're gonna talk about. So first, we're gonna talk about our goal. Secondly, we're gonna move on to our research where we talk about what are we doing and why are we doing this. Third, we're gonna talk about what our solution is and what can we do to find like to do to better for the society. And lastly, we're gonna talk about what can we do in the future regarding our solutions. Before we move on, let's watch a small video. Flaring is the burning of natural gas that occurs during oil production. The burned gas is released into the atmosphere, wasting energy and emitting CO2. Every year, 160 billion cubic meters of gas is flared across the globe. If harnessed, this energy could heat 180 billion homes a year, meet Africa's electricity needs, or supply power locally and regionally. An amount valued at $30.6 billion a year. If there is a way to harness this energy and reduce emissions, would you be on board? Flamex offers a solution for offshore platforms where gas flaring is significant. Our product takes the natural gas going to flare and instead outputs electricity, creates cogeneration capabilities, and processes the carbon dioxide for refrigeration purposes. Oil and gas will be the primary source of our world's energy for years to come. We have an obligation to innovate world-changing solutions that combat these emissions. Our goal is to mitigate climate change through emissions control. Some initiatives that are currently in place towards reducing emissions are ones through the World Bank Global Gas Flaring Reduction Partnerships, which is a grouping of companies that have come together to commit
commit to reducing emissions. Additionally, if you are aware, in the news, the Paris Climate Agreement and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals talk about their initiatives for the future to reduce emissions. Additionally, there are some important facts listed on the slide that illustrate why this is important. 140 billion cubic meters of gas was flared in 2017. That is enough to power Africa's electricity for one whole year. Flaring also releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which is a greenhouse gas contributing to the warming of the climate. Additionally, there is significant loss in financial value in flaring gas. $30.6 billion of revenue was lost in 2017 from flaring gas. Flamex's solution is offered to you to reduce offshore emissions from flaring. When we were presented with this research topic, we realized we needed to do extensive research in order to understand what the problem is, what's currently being done, and how to offer a feasible solution. We know that companies are investing in sending streams of separate oil, gas, and water directly to sales pipelines from the subsea environment. However, this is very capitally intensive, and also the company incurs high amounts of risk from doing the separation on the sea floor. Another incentive to reduce emissions from flaring is a carbon tax that is in place to incentivize less flaring. This does re reduce flaring. However, it does not do anything to harness the energy that can come from this flaring. Also, Norway, in Norway, regulations are already putting, being put in place that require offshore platform operators to shut down production if flaring reaches a certain level. Action is required for companies with offshore assets to stay ahead. After carefully researching our, pro our problem, we came up with the five research design requirements. Our design requirements included having a small footprint because on, uh, on sh offshore facilities are already limited on space, we needed to have a small footprint for our system. We also needed to accept variable rates to include different rates for uh, the gas. We also needed to maintain our facility and have it easy to make it easy to maintain for our on offshore personnel. For this reason, we included only two moving parts, the first one being the turbine and the second one being the uh, CL2 recovery system. With this, it would help us make, keep it easy to maintain and we, we will also be capturing emissions and harnessing energy. When we were considering what, what products our, our, our designs were gonna be, we considered a couple different designs. The first one being liquefying natural gas. Liquefying natural gas has an input of natural gas and then it, it is cooled down and from there it is stored and then it is transported to wherever it needs to go. However, this solution has already existed so we decided not to go with this since it's not as innovative as we would have liked. We also consider hydrogen extraction. Hydrogen extraction takes in the natural gas and then it is divided into two components, the hydrogen and the oxygen. From there, we are able to generate electricity. However, hydrogen is very volatile and profoundly flammable, so we decided that we were not gonna go follow through with this design since it was gonna harm our safety and it was not the design we wanted to go with. Furthermore, we decided to go with a design that met our, our requirements, but also could be implemented into existing facilities. So our design takes the natural gas that is normally sent off into the flare stack and takes it and puts it in the um, enclosed combustion unit, which is then fed into our gas turbine. Our gas turbine outputs electricity, in this case, 20 megawatts of power, which is enough to power the entire, or one third of meet one third of the rig's entire electricity needs. It also outputs hot exhaust that's fed into a heat exchanger surrounded by a phase change material. This phase change material can store energy, in this case, 10 to 15 megawatt hours of energy. To put this in perspective, that's enough to provide power for 10,000 homes. Um, this phase change material can store the latent heat for up to three days this heat is required in offshore drilling because when you get down to the surface of the sea level, 
um, it's really low temperatures, and so we need to heat up that, that oil at the bottom of the, of the surface of the seat. Um, this cool exhaust is then fed into a gas recovery system where we can produce li liquid carbon dioxide as well as produce dry ice. So within this solution, there were a lot of risks that we needed to account for. Um, the first was the system's capability to accept variable flow rates. Um, a lot of time with flarings, you're not gonna receive consistent flow rates. And at the time when we have large spikes of pressure that's coming through, we have to be able to relieve that. So um, we have a pressure relief valve that if we can't take all the pressure in our pipes, the valve will open and it will flare off the excess natural gas. Um, as well as we had to take into account that the rig is actually a floating platform, meaning we have to maintain its balance. So currently rigs use um, diesel turbines. So for our design, we're gonna replace one of those diesel turbines. Most rigs have typically six um, of those diesel turbines. We'll replace one of those and put our gas turbine in to solve that problem. And then our heat exchanger and our gas recovery system will be placed on the rig to where they can kind of balance each other out and counteract um, the moments that are gonna be associated with them. So in summation, we are able to generate enough electricity to power one third of the rig's daily electricity needs. This will reduce load on the conventional electricity generation methods through the diesel engines. We will also, with the generated heat, we will also employ co-generative techniques to improve existing turbine efficiency while also providing heat for drilling operations. Also with the generated dry ice, we will use that as refrigeration for food storage, as well as abrasive blasting techniques to be able to clean and maintain rig equipment. So for our future work, we realize that our design is in its preliminary stages. However, this innovation has a wide array of applications. So here's our plan. With the collected CO2, we wish to ship this onshore to use for applications in construction concrete, as well as polymers and plastic productions. Also, energy poverty is a real serious need in, around the world. In these countries especially, flaring is a very prevalent issue and it's not reg regulated adequately. We hope to harness the wasted energy from flaring to not only reduce the emissions, but also provide the people with electricity to help alleviate energy poverty all around the world. And that is Flamex. Thank you very much, Flamex. Judges, you have five minutes for questions. Yeah, real quick, can you guys talk about uh, where you came up with the one-third of the rig power needs? What's your backup data for that? Yes, yeah, so basically we use thermodynamic equations to generate how much energy was generated by the combustion of the natural gas and how much of that energy goes into the work output of the turbine. So that's basically how much energy was, how much electricity was generated by that work output of the turbine. Now this is assuming we are under the Brayton cycle with 100% efficiency. On an actual case, since we are using co-generative techniques, this efficiency may go down to potentially 80 or 70%. But still, we believe we can, we know we can supply a significant portion of the rig's daily electricity needs. Yeah, my question is, uh, have you ever, ever seen the flaring? Yes. We there have. are lots of solids, there are lots of waters, and uh, lots of, you know, you need to separate lots of things. Mm -hmm. And also, flow rate is completely fluctuating. Yes. How you can handle it? So, exactly. yeah. the flow rate is constantly fluctuating. However, there are random spikes when we cannot maintain the flow rate. For that, we have the pressure relief system to be able to alleviate those random spikes to go back to our conventional technique. However, for large, significant portions of the time, we can contain these spikes to use for natural combustion. There have been developments of gas turbine, micro turbines, which can take these natural gases from flaring and directly combust it and absorb the energy from there. And we hope to employ those type of turbines. Did you do any cost benefit analysis to see, or ROI calculations to see how much additional cost this um, hardware would, would require mm -hmm. of the rig, uh, so, as well as what, what the repayment on that might be? So the initial cost for implementing all this infrastructure would be higher, however the long term benefit, you have to understand that these flaring gases, they're just being wasted. There's no benefit economically or environmentally to just flaring it off. We are providing, no matter how efficient our system is, we are providing a positive gain economically through the production of the energy 
because the, the regular load on the diesel engines will be alleviated, so we don't have to supply as much fuel. Not only that, we'll be supplying carbon dioxide, which can be used for applications on the rig and onshore applications in terms of concrete and polymer plastic production, so we can sell that as well. So in the long run, we believe we have significant cost benefits. To uh, further that as well, the design that we're coming up with, because we know that offshore projects are typically very capitally intensive, um, with the example I mentioned of the subsea facilities and separation processing, our design is mostly trying to just be add, added on to what's existing in order to improve and alleviate potential high costs of starting something new. Um, these technologies exist in our everyday lives, but we're trying to bring it together and implement it in a way that's cost efficient and also beneficial to um, help sustainability and the environment. Thank you for the Who would your customer be? So our customers would be people who maintain, people who are running these oil rigs. So you realize that when they're flaring off these gases, that's a huge opportunity cost going away. The incentive for, say, any company that's using these oil rigs is that added cost from what we are losing from flaring off. Also, in addition to that, we will be producing CO2. There are a lot of companies that use the carbon dioxide to produce concrete, which is a great need in infrastructure production, as well as in potential polymers and plastic products. So we can sell that CO2 to potential smaller companies that use the carbon dioxide to produce different various types of plastics, polymers, and whatnot. Yeah, so the, I guess the primary customer for what we're offering would be an offshore operator, an ENP producer company, and then they would be incentivized to invest in our technology because of the pressures being put on them by global entities such as the United Nations and the people behind the Paris Climate Agreement to and their investors as well that are curious about what they're doing to measure their environmental footprints. And they would be incentivized both by that and then with being able to find those markets in developing countries that have a need for electricity, they'd be incentivized to sell the electricity generated from the offshore platform from our flaring, um, from our flaring product to help them um, invest in what we are offering. And as we mentioned, um, currently our solution was designed for offshore platforms, but it can also be taken to onshore, to refineries, to chemical plants. Um, we're always looking for new innovative ways to capture these emissions and to harness this energy. And Flamex, thank you very much for your time and all the questions. One, three, one, two, three. Flamex. <laughs> All right, Gas Binders is up next. If y'all could come forward and uh, get ready for the presentation. And now, Gas Finders. Hello, I hope everyone is well. We are the Gas Finders, and our task for this Aggies Invent Challenge is to create a device to find, to de detect gas in the drilling riser. So, my name is Javier Palacios. I'm a junior petroleum engineer. My name is Mojola Malamon, master's student petroleum engineering, class of 21. I'm Nefemi Assange, sophomore petroleum engineer. I am a Bharati Kanan. I am a graduate electrical engineer. I'm Sai. I'm a master's student in mechanical engineering. I'd like to start this presentation with a short video which denotes the importance of solving this problem. This is the Piper Alpha Blowout, which occurred on July 6, 1988, in the North Sea. This horrible catastrophe claimed the lives of 167 people on the rig. More so, the blowout had a catastrophic impact on the environment. It is estimated that 5 tons of highly toxic chemicals 
were released into the environment, a situation which led the government to consider banning fishing in the North Sea. Apart from the environmental effects, blowouts also have huge economic repercussions. A company loses billions of dollars in the event of a blowout. The local economy like fishing and tourism industries are also largely affected by a blowout. So, how does this tragedy occur? It could occur while drilling to the formation. The reservoir fluids are usually controlled by maintaining a greater pressure in the drilling fluid than in the reservoir fluid. However, an unexpected increase in the reservoir pressure can allow reservoir fluids to enter the well bore. If not controlled, the fluids will flow into the floating drilling rig and uncontrollably blow out into the environment. By attaching your device to the blowout preventer, we are able to detect free gas in the riser and divert it before it reaches the oil rig at the surface. Before we talk about our solution, a quick overview of offshore drilling. Offshore drilling has basically five components. The first component is a drill shape. The drill shape is a floating drill drilling rig on the surface of the water. And then the second component is the riser. The riser is essentially a pipe going down from the drill ship to the blowout preventer. The blowout preventer, also known as the BOP, lies on the surface of the ocean floor. It is a stack of valves and control mechanisms which help to prevent a blowout. The fourth and the fifth components, the drill pipe and the drill bit, are housed in the riser. The drill bit is connected to the drill pipe and the drill bit is responsible for grinding into the earth to drill the hole in the earth. Fluid, drill fluid is pumped down through the drill pipe to the drill bit, and the drill, drilling fluid clears up the debris by taking it up through the annulus, which is the space between the riser and the drill pipe, as is shown in the video. So, how, how do we solve this problem? Our team looked at three concepts. First, we looked at differential density analysis, which is the most common method of trying to solve this problem. We did this by looking, well, by applying Bernoulli's principle at two points. One on the rig while pumping, and the second on our riser while the dirty, while the dirty drilling fluid was coming back up. However, we ran into several problems when trying to calculate pressure drop. This is due to the fact that the, four, the rocks we are drilling into are currently changing, and sometimes our drilling fluid is lost into the, into the rocks. So then we looked at uh, another alternative, which is magnetism and the drilling fluid. We would do this by introducing ferromagnetic components into our drilling fluid, such as iron, um, iron fillings. The iron fillings will create a magnetic field in the drilling fluid. When, well, when pumped down, down when pumped down into the formation, if gas comes into our drilling fluid, this magnetic field would be distorted and could be potentially measured. However, we ran into some problems due to the fact that we have to clean this drilling fluid after drilling. So the iron fillings, which was our ferromagnetic material, would be sorted out of the drilling fluid. Our team decided to pursue, uh, to pursue a solution using the permitiv uh, permittivity analysis of the drilling fluid by putting a device on the, BL, the BOP, or the blowout preventer. The reason we went for this method is because the capacitance, the permittivity values depend solely on, comp, on drilling fluid composition. Also, by using the permittivity analysis, we would require a few, compon uh, few components, and they could be easily installed on the BOP, which is, with, which is a problem oftentimes due to difficulty in working underwater. The basic principle of our design is capacitance. Capac capacitance is the ability for the capacitor to store a charge between the two plates. The formula for capacitance is given by the dielectric constant of the fluid multiplied by the area of the plate divided by the distance between the two plates. Since we know the cross-section area and the distance between the two plates, we can directly calculate the dielectric constant of the fluid. Water has a really relatively high dielectric constant compared to the reservoir gases found while drilling. 
this is good for us because 80% of the drilling fluid used in drilling is water-based. So we can detect when there's a reservoir gas inside our drilling fluid. So uh, this image shows a location of a prototype. Uh, it is located within the blowout preventer. So these images are the cross section and the top view of a prototype. Uh, the two plates, the one in the blue and the red, are uh, charged plates. They are separated and insulated from each other. Uh, a, a electrical signal is applied between them and an electrical field is generated between them. So whenever a gas passes between uh, the electric field, there's a huge drop in the permittivity and therefore we get a large drop in the capacitance. This is measured by a, a device and it's a, it is a transmitted to the offshore rig. Uh, so as you can see, uh, our uh, design is really simple. It can be easily installed in the existing infrastructure. Uh, the subsidy is really harsh. The uh, pressure is going to be extremely high. So we have designed our uh, prototype to withstand the temperatures of up to 350 degree Fahrenheit and the pressures of up to uh, 20,000, uh, 15,000 PSI. The resolution of our device is uh, currently at 2,000 ppm. That is, uh, it can detect 2% volume change in uh, gas and the drilling fluid, but it can be improved by using advanced methods like dielectric profiling. Okay. Our module is going to sit on the BOP stack, and it detects the change in capacitance of the fluid passing through the riser. This data is then transferred as a form of electric signal uh, in the form of a wave uh, through a cable in the umbilical cord to the control panel. In the control panel, this signal is decoded to present it as a graph of relative permittivity with time. The, the engineer sitting in the control panel, he can see the live graph of relative permittivity with time, and whenever he sees a sudden change in the relative permittivity, it can be attributed to the passage of gas inside the fluid going to the riser. He can then divert this gas to a safe location in order to avoid a possible accident and causing an explosion. So this is a solution essential. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> you guys, you have five minutes for questions. Just uh, real quick with this last uh, slide you you Speak had. into the microphone a little bit yeah, better, I'm sorry. Real quick with the last slide you had here with um, showing the kind of an HMI panel where you're monitoring the signal. Are there plans for alarm set points to where it would automatically uh, trigger an alarm to somebody if somebody's not visually looking at the panel right there? Um, yes, of course. Everything could be programmed into the software that actually decodes the signal. And we were actually looking into, into a system that could even tell you about the kind of rock that we're drilling into because the formation would also slightly affect the permittivity. So you could even get more drilling data. Our, uh, our system is going to be interfaced with the control and data acquisition system in the offshore rig. So it is available to the offshore engineers to do whatever they can with the data. Hello. Uh, I have a long program. That, uh, do you have a, a supporting document of the capacitance with the drilling fluid? plus small amount of gas. Usually, amount of gas is not so large. Mm. So do you have such kind of data? Uh, we have uh, uh, gathered our uh, data on permittivity on various documents. Uh, so we have our calculations, and, uh, and based on which, we have uh, come to the conclusion that we can detect 2% change in volume in uh, the drilling fluid and the uh, uh, formation gases. So 1%, 2%, you can detect it? Yeah, 2% we can detect. That's the resolution of our device. I would also like to note that drilling rigs do have the capacity to contain small amounts of gas, and there is a gas separator at the top. It's when it comes to big quantities in one at one time that you run into problems. Okay. Thank you. Judges, any other questions? So, just one last one. Um, oh, go ahead. You did mention it's just for water-based, correct? Yes, yes sir. sir. Okay. Are there any plans to look into any 
the sensor being applicable to oil based muds? Uh, so, uh, when it comes to oil based muds, the oil is going to have a lower uh, permittivity. So, we can introduce materials with high permittivity and uh, we can implement our system. Basically, the main problem we're running into right now is relative permittivity of water is 80 compared to the natural gas, which is around 1.5 to 1.8. However, oil is 2.1. So that difference isn't big enough for us to detect a uh, solid change in permittivity. Again, from a cost perspective, um, you mentioned the well done on the, on the requirements around the, the device itself. Um, was, was there any thought given to what materials would actually be needed for that? What kind of a, a cost structure you'd be looking at in order to implement something like this? Seems relatively simple, however, right? Based on the requirements, what, what 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 cost would you assume would be implemented with something like this? Well, uh, we can uh, safely assume it's going to be low cost. Uh, uh, for a simple device with uh, uh, low electrical interfaces, it is going to cost us uh, less than, uh, we can say, $5,000. And well done on considering the user experience for the operator. Points for that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Gas and Chuck. The next team is going to be Power Protector. And now we're ready for power protectors. All right, howdy everybody. Uh, we are power protected. My name is Alex Suda. I'm a sophomore, sophomore computer engineering major. My name is Tyler Rahman. I'm a general engineer and I'm a sophomore. My name is Tyler Calhoun. I'm a freshman general engineering major. I'm Megan Chong. I'm a sophomore mechanical engineering major. I'm Rudron Shikshit. I'm a freshman general engineering major. Trent Tutko, senior electrical engineer, or uh, senior nuclear engineering major. Now that you know us, let's get to know our problem with a short video. Four or five kids run back in their trailer and then the tornado hit it and they were gone. People are still without power across West Michigan tonight, nearly three full days after a strong storm swept the area. Hurricane Maria slamming into the island and as you heard, one official saying the island is destroyed. 150 mile an hour winds ripping buildings apart, knocking out power everywhere. All of the electricity is out tonight. Natural disasters such as hurricanes and earthquakes can be catastrophic to the largest of cities around the world. In a matter of seconds, basic human necessities may be ripped apart, leaving people with just the clothes on their back. And when power lines fall and the city's main electrical grid is compromised, staying alive becomes a challenge for everyone involved. Important medicines such as insulin need refrigeration. Loved ones have no way to communicate with their family. Without power, a natural disaster can easily be life-changing for many. But what if the community never lost power? What if your power was protected? Buildings are connected to the main electrical grid. Microgrids are supporting grids powered by various applications. Power Protected innovates by continuously harvesting solar energy and storing it in thermal batteries until the main grid fails. The microgrid then isolates and will seamlessly supply a building with power. With Power Protected, nobody is powerless. 
All right. Now, as seen in the video prior and as displayed on the slide, the devastating effects of natural disasters are ample, including causing detrimental impact to electrical power grids. This impact will oftentimes lead to thousands of individuals to be without power, allowing for the potential of life-threatening situations to arise. This, an example of this is when Hurricane, Mer Hurricane Harvey landed and over 300,000 individuals were left without power and left in distress. Clearly, the need to maintain power during natural disasters is therefore required. With regards to the design requirements for our product, we established five main elements that our product would apply by, and the first of those being the response time. Uh, the response time for our product would be immediate and would be integrated seamlessly as a natural disaster actually occurs. Secondly, would be the uh, area that our product would supply energy to, and this would be a relief center or a community center that people go to whenever a natural disaster occurs, and we approximate this to be approximately 2,500 people. Next would be the size of the unit, and the size of our unit would be less than five cubic meters. Fourth would be the energy output that our unit would output, and that would be 80 kilowatts per hour. And just to put that into perspective, that's four full-size refrigerators being supplied energy for 20 days. And finally, the last thing we set to consider was the efficiency of our product. The efficiency of our product would have to have an energy yield that would be greater than 18%, and that 18% was established by considering the energy yield of a simple gas operator that, most, that, that the average American family owns in their household. So some of the proposed solutions that we considered prior to considering our main solution was the first one being off-site energy. This would route energy from off-site solar or uh, wind farms underground to uh, just through the grid. And the reason we didn't find this feasible is because due to any natural disaster such as an earthquake, the connection between, those, between that grid could be disrupted. Secondly, we considered a solar microgrid, which would, be which would implement the microgrid with solar thermal panels and thermal energy storage. Next, we considered burning the byproduct of the disaster uh, debris. And the one main reason that we considered that to not be feasible was due to the fact that it was just debris and that it would not be sustainable for a large period of time. So with that being said, we considered the solar microgrid to be our solution. So you might ask yourself, what are microgrids? Well, microgrids function as a safety net for small areas or buildings, and they, they're unique in that they can function independently from a failing main electric grid. This is essential for areas affected by natural disasters because they're oftentimes cut off from the main electric grid. Microgrids are also unique in that they can take extra load off the main power grid. This is done through either renewable energy or more reliable forms such as diesel. They're also unique in that they can provide year-round renewable energy to the main power grid, thereby taking load off. Our design uses solar thermal panels to collect the energy and store it into phase change material as thermal energy. Once we are needing to access it, this energy, we can convert it into electricity using thermoelectric generators. These solar thermal panels absorb energy as heat, which means they are 70% more efficient than your photo photovoltaic panels. This means that in six months, we can fully charge the battery with only one square meter of air. So as Tyler mentioned, we're using solar thermal panels which take heat energy. Once we have this heat battery, what do we do with it? We put it into thermal. Thermal batteries are those red fins that you see in that section cut. Thermal batteries are full of phase change materials. Phase change materials store and release energy while going through phase changes, say solid to liquid. The phase change material that we have chosen is Pure Temp 151. It's been engineered in a lab to have a specific, a high heat storage capacity of 217 joules per gram. Every single gram of our PCM can store 217 joules and release 217 joules. You may ask, when are we storing this energy? The answer is any ordinary day. If we had a power protected unit outside of AM University right now, it would be storing energy. It's storing that energy until a disaster comes, the main electrical grid is compromised and we need to access it. When we need to access it, access this energy, we go to the Seebeck effect. The Seebeck effect takes two materials, one designated as a hot plate. The hot plate is pressed up against the PCM, and the cool plate is apart here, and it's exposed to ambient air. So you have two materials and a temperature gradient, and then you get a voltage difference. 
When you connect this to a circuit, you're getting an electrical current. And this electricity can be used for your buildings, your houses, your fridges, and your phones. A main component of our product was innovation. We wanted to be innovative. So you may ask, why a microgrid? Why not a backup generator? Well, a backup generator is there in case of a disaster. A microgrid is there 24-7. When there is not a disaster, it is storing energy and it's also feeding and supporting your main grid. Additionally, with the backup generator, there is a delay in its response. You lose power and you have to wait. You have to wait and hope that your backup generator is gonna kick in. With the microgrid, it's seamless. You never lose your power. Next, we're talking solar thermal panels. If you have a house right now with solar panels, you actually have photovoltaic panels. Solar thermal panels are proven to be 70% more efficient. Lastly, we're using thermal batteries. Thermal batteries are consistent and repeatable. Right now, thermal batteries are being used in power plants. They go through thousands of cycles in these power plants. For us, one cycle is one natural disaster. That means that we can go through thousands of natural disasters with one power protected unit. So where and how would we implement this solution? So ideally we'd want them in relief centers. So that could be anything from schools to libraries to uh, places of worship or stadiums. So our energy output that we're shooting for is 86 kilowatt hours. That is like, uh, like Alex said, one refrigerator is about uh, one kilowatt hour for a full day and a small microwave is half of that. So the cost analysis, that's the big one. Um, so our total system would cost a little over $50,000. Now that's actually kind of good news because the bulk of our price was in the battery. The thermal battery was $36,574. But, or the leading competitor, or the competitor that's closest to us is Tesla. And they have a breakthrough in lithium ion uh, technology. And their cost for their batteries are $40,000. Our thermal batteries are 60 to 80% more efficient and uh, or 6 to 80% more cheaper and six times more efficient. Now I understand that you may not be fully on board with a $50,000 price tag, but I can assure you that microgrids are where you want to be investing, especially looking at the industry and how it's going on an upward trend. It's supposed to increase from being a $10.9 billion industry to more than 30 billion from 2016 to 2022. Furthermore, if you look at how many communities have been, have been affected by microgrids, a lot of the impact has been positive. Looking at Puerto Rico and how they've revolutionized their energy industry from falling apart in Hurricane Maria to transitioning to more than eight different microgrids in the last year. So thank you guys for listening to us. We'll take your questions. Thank you very much, Power Protected. Judges, do you have questions? So I saw in your design requirements, you said that you were targeting the relief centers. So what made you choose to just do relief centers and not homes? So we, we felt like with homes, one, the cost would be pretty high. And then two, um, so, so we wanted a central system, but we didn't want to go too spread out just because we believe that during a natural disaster, um, it wouldn't be as effective. So kind of like what Taha was saying, um, we considered a central hub in one city, but um, usually people crowd around community centers, so we thought it would be more efficient to have those have our product centralized in community center, centers and relief centers that could power a certain amount of like refrigerators, for example, so we can keep, um, I guess, spread out our like medicines, for example, uh, refrigerators, stuff like that. You can keep them into one area, and if one goes out, you're not, you're not uh, finding yourself stranded. Additionally, if a household wanted a power protected unit, So one of the challenges that keeps utilities from coming back up after a natural disaster is not the fact that they can't generate power, it's they're not sure that the grid that they're about to put the power on is safe to where they don't impact emergency responders um, or citizens that are wandering about in the areas where utility lines are down. So you, you talked about having your microgrid near disaster centers, but how do you overcome that challenge of making sure you're not putting a live current back on an infrastructure that has gaps in it. So, so really, um, yeah, so like you said, we, we, that's kind of why we, we decided to kind of have it near the, uh, the refugee centers. Um, 
we do believe that if we do run the lines right next to it, that there should be a short connection and that it, it minimum, I can't say 100% guarantees that there'll be no error, but the, the margin is very thin. And also, like with this system, the microgrid would separate from the main grid in a case of a disaster. And like I said before, if there were any error to occur, um, that's one of the reasons why we consider uh, routing energy from somewhere far away, just because that connection would be, uh, it'd be, I guess, a higher risk in that sense. State for me again what the materials used uh, in the battery cells themselves is and what the environmental effects would be as they need to be decommissioned. Okay, Power Protected, thank you so much. We appreciate it. The next team is Lux Energy. So if Lux Energy will come forward, appreciate it. And now I present Lux Energy. Hi, my name is Tuan Hong, I'm a junior industrial engineer. My name is Peyton Fie, I'm a junior electrical engineering major. My name is Brandon Lipong, I'm a sophomore biomedical engineering major. My name is Jorge Roa, I'm a mechatronics engineer. My name is Noah Huerta, I am a mechanical engineering sophomore. And my name is Sebastian Trinos, I'm a sophomore mechanical engineering student. And we are Lux Energy, bringing the energy to, to you. you. <laughs> and it still keeps continuing to rain. You got a major tornado on the ground. Major tornado on the ground.
is taking everything out in its path. Dorian, people who have lost everything, desperate to get to safety. We should all be prepared. But how do you prepare for this? More than 12,000 people are in shelters all across the island. I don't see my mom. I don't see my son. I don't know. I don't know. Approximately 68 homes were without power. Without power, they don't have water. Hurricane Maria came in with 155 mile per hour winds, knocking out electricity immediately. He says they need more generators, power pools, cable. After more than three months without power. The power grid here in Marsh Harbor was destroyed and will have to be completely rebuilt. The force of the storm knocked out the island's entire energy grid. We need an energy solution. disasters and with that we created a, um, a system that would provide proper illumination at night and would provide communications between a community that has been hit by natural disasters and its outside community and this would also uh, provide medical operations and inside within the community that has been targeted by a natural disaster and would provide water sanitation and food sanitation as well. With our design, we thought it was important to factor in cost, so we want it to be cheap and efficient to manufacture. We also want it to be light so that it can be transported and deployed easily. And with that, we want it to be intermodal, meaning that it can be transported by multiple different means of transportation. We want it to produce three kilowatt hours a day, which we calculated to be the baseline energy for a certain number of population to have basic amenities. And we also want it to survive a long time, have multiple deployments. When considering uh, aspects of our design, we first looked to gasoline generators and then determined it's not realistic to say that these communities will have gasoline available to them after such a disaster. We then looked to renewable energy and determined wind power would not be suitable as we would need high velocity winds to have any sort of significant energy. Manpower would be counterintuitive to helping this community, these communities that have been struck by disasters. As such, we went with solar power. So why solar? So if we take a look at this map, it's a natural disaster risk index. And you can see that many of the countries lying along the equator are at a very high risk of natural disasters. Fortunately, many of these locations as well have very high solar potential. So that is why we came to the conclusion of using solar. So our product is packaged within a rectangular box. Two of the sides of this box are solar panels themselves with a hard covering the outside for protection safe. The way that they're deployed is to say this thing is four feet tall. Someone would pull this up, set it down like, uh, like a fold out table and kick out the legs. This would leave the inside uh, accessible from underneath and from over the top to get to such a thing as a built-in refrigeration unit and a satellite phone. In addition, all of our solar panels are in, uh, have active solar charging. That means that they will tilt to maximize the amount of energy that we can uh, put, uh, capture from the sun. As you can see in the animation, it will, it will follow basically the sun during the peak sun time, which is about four and a half and five hours per day. So when designing our products, again, we want it to be intermodal, which means that it has to be small. So in order to minimize the size of the product, we determined how much energy we needed, which was six kilowatt hours, which is double our goal, but we wanted to have a buffer zone with the energy. And that to produce that amount of energy, we need six panels. And so using the six panels, we designed the box around those constraints. In order to store this energy produced by the solar panels, we included a six kilowatt hour capacity battery you know, uh, just to gather this, uh, st store the energy for nighttime usage. So what are the applications? What is the use of this energy box? So this is not designed as a long-term solution. It's designed as a short-term solution, which would be able to decrease the amount of time it would take for communities to bounce back. Having electricity 
in a very soon after natural disaster will allow communications to be put up. Communication is one of the most important parts after a natural disaster. It would also allow light. Light in a natural disaster is very important as well because many times light is safety and it helps deter violence and crimes. And we would also include a refrigeration unit built into this because medications can go bad very quickly in hot temperatures. Uh, so in terms of the uh, distribution and the marketability of our product, uh, we as a team determined that uh, our primary focus would, to be, uh, would be to target um, humanitarian groups and nonprofit organizations that would directly be assisting these communities in need when they're hit in a natural disaster. Uh, but in the future, we also hope to implement this technology uh, to uh, maybe uh, possibly military applications and providing power to refugee camps or to military bases or even in countries where uh, they have a lot of power restrictions in the government regulations. Uh, we can increase that number by uh, just providing a renewable source for them. Future directions. So in order to keep the shape of our box and and go through different forms of energy. We're, going, we're thinking about making or the, using the same shape of the box, but instead of uh, using solar, solar panels, use other kind of renewable energy, depending uh, of how much of that energy that a specific, a specific place has. As well, we're trying, we, in the future, we, we want to expand our solar array in order to increase the surface area for solar panels. This is just to gather more energy and to be able to help more more, more, more people in the, that community. In addition to these upgrades, we will need to expand our battery capacity to store this extra amount of power. And in addition to all these features, we, we're thinking of motorizing our box, uh, so it could be deployed, it could be deployed by different kinds of tra um, transportation methods, and adding wheels to it, and adding a, a smart navigation uh, to navigate the terrain and where it's actually been deployed. We are Lux Energy. We will be able to help these communities. We bring the energy to, to you. you. Thank you, Lux Energy. <laughs> All right, judges, you have five minutes for questions. Um, what would the selling price be? So the total price of our product, uh, we said we wanted to keep it uh, at, at five thousand dollars. I don't know if you want to break that. Yes, break that down. So basically, the the biggest, the biggest, uh, the most expensive parts in our product will be the solar panels and the batteries. So once we take care of that, and we actually can put the amount of battery capacity that we need to uh, that we are actually producing, because it would be it would be another story if we had you know extra battery capacity, but we can actually produce the power that we we think that we can produce. So the, after taking into consideration the, the batteries and the solar panels, the frame uh, would be would not be that expensive. And so we estimated about $5,000, a little bit less than that for each, each individual box. And that's counting for any sort of construction errors. Our actual estimate is around 4500 So I'm curious, you talked about um, having the sun tracking PV panels uh, to drive efficiencies up, which is a great solution. I'm wondering if you considered any other solutions. So for example, today, the military gets past this problem with easy ups at the entire top of the easy up is a flexible PV panel. So what they lose in terms of efficiency because it's static, they gain in surface area and ease of deplorability, uh, many of which would fit in your intermodal container. So. The reason we went with individual tracking panels is the idea of this is to have two built-in panels and multiple panels that you could take out, attach to the end, and just plug it in. So each individual piece would be tilting, and you could add as many as you want, uh, depending on the size of the area. In, in addition to that, uh, by having flexible solar panels, we might increase the, the price of the, of the manufacturing of, of our product, since it's, most, it's more available from countries like China to get you know, standard solar panels, you know, just, just to keep the, the price down because we have to remember that we're trying to help communities instead of actually getting the money out of them. Lux Energy, sounds to me like you've answered all the questions. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.
And now let me introduce Cool Solutions. Howdy, we are Cool Solutions. I am Ali Mohamed Magnoja, I'm a freshman electrical engineer. I'm Jose Flores and I'm a senior chemical engineer. I'm Sanat Kumar, a grad student in mechanical engineering. I'm Aeon Sinesha and I'm a freshman in computer science. And I'm Rebecca Sheikh, a senior in chemical engineering. We are designing a refrigeration solution for developing countries that works without 24 hours a day of supply of electricity. Power outages often occur in developing, in developing countries due to unstable grids. These graphs depict an increase of out, outages in developing countries. In some cases, there are up to 253 outages per year. To solve this problem, we identified five key design requirements that we needed to solve or meet in order to solve the problem. The first of which is cost efficiency, which we define to be less than $1,200, which is the average price of a generator that is powerful enough to power an entire home. We also want to prevent spoilage of food and medicine, which we define or we determined to be a minimum temperature of three degrees Celsius. And we wanted the unit to be forgettable. That is, you install it and you forget you have it. You install it and the only thing that it provides to you is the security of having food that doesn't spoil and medicine that doesn't make you sick. Additionally, the size of the unit shouldn't be greater than 30% that of a regular unit, that is a regular refrigerator or something of similar cooling capacity. And it must be versatile, meaning that it can be scaled anywhere between four cubic feet of cooling and 150 cubic feet of cooling, which is a standard small walk-in medicine refrigerator for a hospital. Uh, with this, we came up with three possible methods. Our first method was a new refrigerator, one that had a single cooling vessel for two refrigeration systems. One refrigeration system was a conventional electrical refrigeration system that used an electric compressor, and the second was derived from an RV refrigerator that used a propane flame to drive an ammonia refrigeration system. The second would be a hyper-insulated conventional refrigerator where the benefit would be that the refrigeration wouldn't seep out of the container as fast because it's hyper-insulated. But our third and ultimately chosen method or solution was an attachment to existing refrigeration units that would provide redundant electrical power in case of grid failure. This is the system we designed to solve this problem and we are calling it a coat attachment. In this system, our controller is connected to the refrigerator as well as to the power grid and controlling the wall as well as the motor. In the center, we have a power generation unit which uses the propane to generate electricity with the help of an engine and an alternator. And overall, this system is very compact. This is the 3D representation of our system which consists of a controller which is the brain of the system which controls everything. Next is our throttle valve, which, which is a one-way valve, which allows the propane from the tank to go to the engine. Then an alternator, which produces the electricity. A high-efficiency Brayton cycle rotary engine, which is helping the uh, alternator to move. A starter motor, which helps the engine to start. And a battery, which powers the controller as well as the motor. And all of this system is just for representation, uh, rep uh, just for visual representation and not to scale.
So this is representing the cool attachment. The fan on the left represents the fridge and the box outside is the power grid. The vent at the back allows the warm air to seep out of the attachment so that um, it doesn't fry. As well as the bottle outside of the attachment shows a propane <coughs> tank attached to, the atta uh, attached to the fridge with the pipe. So the fan is currently moving with the power grid and as we simulate a power grid shut down, the generator actually turns on due to the battery inside of the attachment. And um, using the black box as a controller, it allows electricity to flow inside the generator and back outside of the generator when electricity comes back up. So for specifications of the engine, we will probably be using a rotary engine or a small uh, four-stroke engine. Yeah, potential um, companies that we looked into were miniature star rotor or X minis. These are all high efficient four stroke um, cycles using um, Braden cycles as well. Here we have the dimensions of our product. These are the maximum dimensions and hopefully we'd be able to get it to be smaller using a different engine. And the installation for our product would be very easy so the customer would have no trouble figuring out how to put it on their fridge or get it to work. And it requires no user interference besides refueling after eight hours or so. So the person can go to sleep and not have to worry about their food spoiling overnight. And the manufacturing cost would be approximately $225 based on some quick Amazon research. But we know we'd be able to get it manufactured for a lot cheaper if it was developed in other countries where labor and materials might be a lot more affordable. As of this past month, the world average for the price of pro propane was about 59 cents per liter. So although the price would really vary between regions, it would be relatively affordable for no matter what country the product is sold in. Propane is also widely available worldwide, so it wouldn't really be a problem getting a hold of it for people in developed countries. It's definitely available in Asia and Africa and a lot of places where developing countries tend to be. And it's already commonly used, so people are very familiar with how to keep it safe and all that. And it's also a lot more sustainable than diesel. And Now, the question that might be in your head is why, how is this any different from a normal power generation system that connects to the outside of a house? The main component that, or the main feature that makes it so different is that it's small. It's only designed to produce the power or produce the electricity that the refrigerator needs. So that is, the reason we chose an electronic throttle valve is that the propane flow will throttle to produce just enough electricity for the refrigerator to run. And that's something that the controller would take into account. So this would make it, Running, make running it a lot cheaper than using a gas or an electric RV refrigerator. And it's also high efficiency. Most, most generators that are designed to use propane are also designed to use gasoline. And because they're designed to work with two different fuel systems, it innately makes them less efficient. Additionally, it's automated. Like we said, we wanted it to be forgettable. You go to work, while you're at work, your refrigerator goes out, you can come back home, your food is still good, and you wouldn't need to refuel. And we say it's an eight hour cycle, but that or an eight hour refrigerator, but that's for a small tank, 16 ounces of fuel. The tank that, the tank that most people use in, develop, in developing countries is a large tank, your typical propane tank, and that would run much longer than eight hours. Than eight hours. And I can't stress it enough that it's not a new refrigerator. You take it, you buy it, it's relatively cheap, and you put it on the refrigerator that you already have. There's no need to convince people to go out and buy another refrigerator. They can buy security for their food, they can buy security for their medicine by buying an attachment, and they put it on the refrigerator. Now that being said, we're cool solutions, and this is the solution. Thank you very much, cool solution. And judges, you have five minutes for questions. So uh, the one thing I didn't see in your uh, mock-up was how you were going to handle the exhaust coming off the engine when you combust the propane. 
Um, and, and so I was waiting to see if you describe this as an attachment outside the dwelling connected electrically in, but you said a couple times connected directly to your refrigerator. So I thought I would ask that question to see had you thought through that aspect. Right, so propane, it, they use it to cook inside. So they already widely burn these flames inside of their house. And if the flow of the propane is small enough, then the exhaust would be able to be vented out the back and the ventilation system of the house would take care of it. So you said it attaches to the existing refrigerator. Um, and I, can I make the assumption that um, the existing refrigerator actually cools inside of this box while this, while this unit isn't needed? Can you store um, perishables inside of this particular unit? Okay, so if we can go back to this image here and Senate can explain how exactly this is supposed to go on. So, yeah. So this is the system which is connected to the power grid as well as the refrigerator. So whenever there is electricity in the house, it will directly direct that power to the refrigerator without using any of the components in the system. Whenever it will detect there will is a power outage, it will directly start the power generation unit, which is like transferring of propane to the uh, engine and then uh, moving the alternator, which will generate electricity. And it will direct that electricity now to the refrigerator without doing anything, like without doing any human intervention. We may have misunderstood your question, but this is an external unit. It okay. doesn't go inside of the refrigerator. Gotcha, okay, that's what so I missed. So it attaches on top or next to or behind. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, so just real quick, Walk me through this. So the physical size was one by two and a half by two of the actual unit, and that does not include the propane tank. No, no, sir. Okay. And is it a, you? So in addition to this unit, you will have a propane tank of whatever size you choose, and then it would be plumbed elsewhere. Are you assuming that they'll just stick it next to the refrigerator? I mean, is the, the, the person who purchases this, they expect it to, to route all this to itself, or does it come one kit together? Okay, I, I understand. So I, I spent 10 weeks in Morocco this past summer, and they use propane for everything. They have a huge tank of it in the kitchen because they use it to cook, and typically the kitchen is close to the, to the bathroom where they take showers, and they use it to boil hot water to take showers with. So the tank is already there. All they need to do is take a hose and connect it to it, and that's what makes it so simple. There's one wire that goes into the box and a wire that goes out of the box that you plug into the wall, and the only thing you have to do is connect the hose from the tank that you already use on a daily basis to this unit, and you have security. Easy implementation, which was one of our driving factors for using this, this system. Did you give any consideration to the decibel levels of the unit? We did not. We did not. However, um, if, if you're referring to the video, we wanted the noise so that you could Sure, yeah, but, but diesels and winkles, winkle engines, rotary engines are not particularly quiet. Right, um, typically, so we're aiming to not use a winkle engine, right? Um, winkle rotary engines are inefficient. They burn a lot of oil and they, they aren't very efficient, like I said, right? So a different kind of design of rotary engine where the lobe moves inside of a, there's a sub lobe inside of a bigger lobe where say the outside lobe is has eight cavitations in it and the inside lobe is seven, there's no contact between. So there's no need for oil because there's no metal on metal contact and it would be much more efficient. In particular, this X mini engine, the one that was there was, um, so that X mini engine right there is about the size of an iPhone six, but it can power a go-kart that needs a 40 pound engine. And that's 70 cc. Okay, thank you very much. A cool solution. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take about a 10 minute break. If everyone will be back in here at 4.30, uh, we will get started with the rest of the presentation. Thank you very much.
Welcome back. Uh, we're back from our break, and we're going to hear now from Team Sustenergy. I think I said that correct. If I'm not, y'all get a chance to re correct me. Thank you very much. Howdy. We are Sustenergy. Uh, my name is Bharat Agarwal. I'm a senior mechanical engineer, class of 2020. My name is Vinan Sumendas. I'm a civil, civil engineer, and senior. My name is Dakshita Shivasta. I'm a computer science freshman, class of 2023. My name is Heath Patel. I'm a civil engineer major and my first year graduate student. My name is Abdul Khan. I'm a senior industrial distribution major. Before we go ahead and jump into it, I wanted to share a quick video with y'all. Earth. It gives us life. Helps us grow. We depend on it every day. But have we been taking care of it? And finally, a federal report today predicted possible catastrophic warming of the Earth. Rising carbon emissions. Of climate change. Presidents fearing for their health. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. And all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. Where is Sustenergy? Our goal is to tackle climate change by providing a renewable energy solution. Our carbon-free alternative uses pressure plates on roadways to create energy. As cars drive over the plates, pressure is collected in a hydraulic tank. When maximum pressure is reached, the force of the exiting fluid operates a generator, thereby producing electricity. Like this bus. By distributing this electricity to nearby consumers, we decrease the number of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere thereby making a more environmental and sustainable city. We'd like to welcome you to join us on our mission, to rediscover our potential, to question what's possible, to unlock the world. We're Sustenergy, standing for the future. So let's go ahead and get into our need and problem statement. We established our need as the necessity to create more sustainable cities around the world. The exact problem we wanted to focus on is decreasing the number of greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere. Now you may ask yourself, why is this important? Why does this matter to us? We know that greenhouse gas emissions are the number one leading cause of global climate change. Climate change is a global issue because it goes into many different factors, including food production, water security, and general health and well-being. So when implementing our solution, we wanted to look at which industries emitted the greatest number of greenhouse gases. As you can see from the diagram, transportation and energy are the largest sectors of greenhouse gas emissions. So our solution would look at how we could tackle both of these challenges in one. These are our five requirements. First of all, no carbon emissions. Any solution that we come up with, it would do us no good if we are emitting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Secondly, we generate as much electricity or more than traditional renewable energies, such as wind and solar. Third, our cost has to be less than $1 million per 20 plate installation. We use this metric for the, as comparative to wind farms that produce the same amount of electricity. Fourth, we must accommodate to a lot of vehicles. As we know, in modern cities, many vehicles are traveling around, so we wanted to accommodate as many vehicles as we can in our, into our model. Our fifth and final requirement is adaptability. We want to take our model, not just in the United States, Asia, we want to take it all over the world. Climate change is a global issue, and we want to address it as such. I'm going to pass it on to my teammate, Heath, and he'll go over approaches to our problem. So yeah, our approaches are basically based on the problem statement and to meet the requirements. So we measure out that we can use the mechanical energy that is being wasted by cars on the roads. So as you see on the screen, there is two mechanical, uh, the first one is the magnetic one. So what we use is using the two magnetic plates, opposing charges, uh, same the charges on the opposite uh, section. And when the car comes over the, that one, it creates a repulsive force between that, that two one, and it helps to rotate the spin rotator there, and that goes to the harvest for the energy. But when we dig into this one, we came to know that it doesn't match the conservative, uh, energy conservation load. <laughs> so we switch to the kinetic energy models. But as you see on the screen, there is a too much complex modules in this thing, 
and it is also the very cost very costly to our product like sustainability so we speak to the another this one sustainability solutions and about this one when is going to you please it's going to so to talk about our solution i want you to imagine a self energy sustaining city and how can a lively modern sophisticated city will self sustain itself this is what we want to target we want to get the motion and the potential energy from all the traffic volumes that we have in a metropolitan area and convert it into clean energy. How are we going to do this? By taking the weight of the car applied through uh, the piston that's going to be embedded in the superficial layer of the asphalt without causing any negative access to its structural corpus. And uh, we're going to uh, use that pressure to be collected in a pressure vessel tank, which at the moment, when we reach the 35.5 ATM in that tank, we're going to release that pressure through a turbine, a specifically called uh, uh, turbo expander, and that will create a 14.1 kilowatts power a day. This is uh, possible due to uh, the, the gas we're going to use is going to be a nitrogen, but it can also use CO2, and the turbo turbine expansion uses that uh, energy stored to create. Uh, our electricity. So here you can see a small demonstration of how this pressure vessel is being uh, it's, uh, storing the pressure and uh, the formula that we used for that was PV equals NRT. This is just a schematics on the road of how the energy facility will be on the side of the road. We thought of digging it uh, a hole in the ground but that would be way more expensive than we initially expected. So we can install this in different, different points in the city, in many, many different cities. So this has a global aspect. You can implement it everywhere. Okay. So let's take the example of Texas Avenue and imagine that we established 20 such pressure plates in that area. So this is what our setup would look like when it will be in operation. Using the previous example, we see that 20 pressure plates can produce about 14.1 megawatt hour of energy in a day, whereas a traditional wind farm produces about 16.5 megawatt hour of energy in a day. Now what this comparison shows is that our approach is realistic, it, is, it has high potential, and it is also feasible. By using such energy, we can offset 4,500 tons of carbon dioxide every year. Now, coal plants, produce uh, about 1,500, okay, 5,000 megawatt hour of energy in a year by producing about 4,500 tons of carbon dioxide emission. So this will be the equivalent amount of carbon dioxide emission that we will produce by using such energy. Additionally, since we use the motion of vehicles on roads to harness energy, we are reducing the dependence on uh, fossil fuels like coal, which are extinguishable sources of energy. Next, Bharat will talk about the future and financial aspects of So to further explain upon the feasibility of such energy, uh, we did a little bit of cost breakdown. So after doing the cost breakdown, uh, we we found out that the setup cost of such energy is a quarter of the setup co set, the cost of setup for a traditional wind farm. That means that after the, in the first year after setting up, the cost per kilowatt hour for such energy is just twenty cents when compared to the 60 to 7 cents for a uh, traditional wind farm. So what now I want to talk to you about is the future of sustained energy. So the next steps for sustained energy would be to engage in agile prototyping and testing. This will be an iterative process and we will be basically creating a minimum viable product, testing it, learning from it, and then um, taking those learnings and then redeveloping it. So this is going to be, that we're going to do this until our product reaches its full potential and meets all our new redesigned, uh, redesigned sub-requirements, which are going to be tougher than the requirements that we already have. Thank you. That is all. And we are Sustainergy. Thank you very much, Sustainergy. All right. Judges, you have five minutes for questions. So I'd like to hear more about the cost estimate. How did you get to a setup cost of less than a million for this? Um, I'm glad you asked that. So this is the cost <coughs> breakdown. We took the major confidence, and we also overestimated the labor. So we took confidence such as how much a tank would cost. What would be the cost of, say, the piping? What would be the cost of the turbo expanders that we will be using? 
And using these, this is the rough estimate that we came down to. So I'm, I'm curious, as you looked at um, your solution and comparing it to wind farms and things, um, did you look at um, the embodied carbon of both solutions? If your key metric is uh, CO2 savings, how does the embodied carbon in either of the two solutions compare with one another? So our key metric is the carbon emission associated with generation. But that is a really good question, and we did not take that into account, the actual setting up process, how much carbon emission that would produce. But that is definitely something that we should look into uh, in the future. If you install this uh, uh, device, probably the sky is going up or down, and it may create more accident, and uh, how, how do you solve this kind of problem? Uh, so you, you're saying that the road is going to be regular? going up and down, so this is designed to a way that it won't affect the motion of the car. Uh, by It can be implemented in highway because highway speeds get uh, really high and that will create disturbance in the driving, but if it's in a regular 35 to 40 miles per hour avenue, it can be implemented because our delta elevation in the bump is no more than one inch. So if you're driving on the on the piston, it's going to be as it's embedded, embedded on the ground, you won't feel the difference uh, as if it was all the way in the ledger. Yeah, <laughs> you guys had mentioned that uh, you looked at bearing the portion of the equipment. Yeah. That would be you know, pretty expensive. Did you mention what size of the equipment would be now on the side of the road or wherever we're storing the energy? Right, so we looked into basically consolidating what will be on the site, so having a uh, energy facility on the side of the road. So it would be like another building, but you wouldn't really okay. go into it. So there it. wouldn't be one at, at each bump along the right. way? Right, so it works like, right now we have it to one tank connected to two bumps. Okay. So we have 20, 20 say so you have 20 of these pressure plates, mm -hmm. you have one tank for each of those, so you have 10 tanks. Now these. 10 tanks would be consolidated into one area to say just maintain the aesthetic of the environment. Yeah, I mean, my one thought about <clears throat> your cost breakdown is does it factor in, you know, the real estate you're going to be taking up to put this facility? Uh, it does not. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Sustain Energy. I appreciate it. The next team up is D4. We present D4. Howdy everyone. We are D4, which stands for Drilling Dysfunction Detection Device. 
Hello, my name is Enrique. I'm an interdisciplinary engineering PhD candidate. I'm Naren. Uh, I'm a PhD student with the Petroleum Engineering Department. My name is Connor, and I am studying manufacturing and mechanical engineering technology. Hi, I'm Andrew, and I want to study chemical engineering. Hello, my name is Devin, and I would like to study mechanical engineering. Unfortunately, accidents do happen. However, the integration of automation can revolutionize oil and gas extraction efforts by minimizing potential risk, which leads to improved safety and efficiency. Modern drilling operations consist of a rig and its controls, which tells the drill bit how to operate. The downhole bit then creates and transmits data to the surface, where it is processed by a computer and read by an operator, who then adjusts the controls. This process can be timely and the delay can create problems. Our solution is implementing the D4, which processes data downhole and transmits it directly back to the controls with the operator having the ability to oversee the process in order to intervene if he or she sees necessary. This minimizes delays and potential risk. The D4 features pre-trained machine learning methodologies to derive the most efficient models that can be implemented and processed in real time at the bit. Our product has been tested to withstand the most corrosive and harsh environments, as well as being designed to plug and play with most standard equipment in service today. So as we learned from the video, unfortunately problems and accidents do happen in drilling operations, which leads us to create, the, which creates the need for automation in the oil and gas industry. Now one of the biggest hurdles with approach to automation is a lot of people have too wide of a scope when approaching automation. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to focus our efforts on a single problem. That problem being mitigating or minimizing dysfunctions, dysfunctions in the drilling procedures. And our solution to that would be implementing the D4. So it's really important to understand what the D4 is. For us, it is our simplified and focused approach to automation. But of course, we have to understand exactly how it works. <clears throat> it works by implementing microcontrollers and um, high-tech high sensors down at the bit in order to process at the bit in order to react and detect uh, dysfunctions in real time. This minimizes the delay in the drilling operations and leads to much more safer and efficient drilling. This safer in terms of um, not having that delay uh, in the drilling process and that will also lead to more efficient drilling and that efficiency in drilling uh, translates directly into dollars saved. Here we have the rig, the driller, the controls, as well as the bit. Data is collected at the bit and transferred to the surface where it can be processed by the processor. The driller is able to interpret that data and make a decision uh, based on that data and uh, emit that to the controls. All of these steps here have time delays, which are critical parts of our assessment. By introducing the D4 at the bit, the processor is able to move down hole into a position where it can transmit data directly to the controls, eliminating unnecessary steps in the transformation of data. These are our three design ideas, first being multiple layers of communication, as well as intelligence at the surface. However, we decided that a third solution, the D4, was the best solution, implementing both ideas from multiple controls, levels of communication, sorry, and intelligence, rather, downhole. All right, so the main five requirements for, for D4 were the following. First, it has to be modular. By modular, I mean it has to be compatible with the, what's out there in the drilling industry today. It has to be plug and play with the existing drilling tools and bottom plot assemblies. Second, it has to be robust. Robust means it has to be able to withstand the harsh environments of a, that the drill bit is having downhole. And we're talking about high vibration shocks, high temperatures, etc., etc. Third, it has to be able to run state-of-the-art algorithms at the bed. <clears throat> By state-of-the-art, I mean complex optimization techniques, machine learning, either supervised or unsupervised, and some trained deep learning net, uh, neural networks. Fourth, it has to be cost-efficient. By cost-efficient, I mean, the from the operator's side of po point of view, the investment needed to buy the product and, and 
put it on the rigs, it's minimal. When you compare this to the greater returns on investment and the higher safety of the operation per well, per field, and around the world. Lastly, it has to be able to perform in real time. For this, we're using high performance hardware that runs parallelized compiled trained neural nets or machine learning models to be able to gather data, filter it, process it, analyze it, and then give us an output if we're having these functions or not, or any other inefficiency down. So moving on to innovation about the product, we want to highlight about three major ideas which are the unique selling points of this product. So the first one is the processing itself. The whole idea of uh, our device is centralized around this uh, particular point. We want to bring the processor down for, to the bit. So uh, the way we achieve is by using the advanced processors. So five or 10 years back, it was not possible because the processors were huge. But with the latest advancement in technology, it's possible now. And the second point, or the second innovative idea about this product is using uh, the machine learning and the artificial intelligence algorithms. So we have these algorithms or uh, the models which have been uh, used in other industries and have proven solutions. We want to adapt those solutions and bring it to our oil and gas industry. And when we talk about machine learning, it cannot solve all the problems. So first we have to identify whether uh, this is a good solution for the problem we are trying to address. So as a proof of concept, we have, assimilated, uh, we have simulated some real-time data, which is close to the actual drilling data. And we ran some uh, initial preliminary exploratory analysis. And this is what we found. So our problem is mitigating dysfunctions. But the first step is to identify them first. And that's exactly what our model does. Identifying uh, the four corners represent the four common dysfunctions downfall. So our model with the sim simulated data was able to clearly identify those dysfunctions. And the processor, what it does is next, uh, it automatically tries to maintain the drilling conditions to be in the only the optimum region. So that way we can improve the efficiency. Third point of our innovation is the visualization engine. Here you see an animation of what was. It's a preliminary visualization engine running on the cloud. We're trying to hide all the fancy models and math and have a very simple way of showing the end user the results of the analysis in real time. This is a prototype that we developed over the last 48 hours, and it runs on the Amazon Web Servers and some other cloud computing uh, functionality. So it's really easy to scale up. The D4 is very feasible. Because of its mo modularity, it can be easily implemented into already existing industries and designs out there. And we have analyzed, already published, the data on industrial materials in order to determine which one is the best for the D4. And it can be ap applicable to all rigs, offshore, onshore, et cetera. So what we've done so far is we've established our first prototype. And the next step in our process would be to secure more funds in order so that we can um, have more research and development in order to create the actual best product that we possibly can. Once we've got the, those funds under our belt, essentially, we want to design, fabricate, and test a much more um, critical component in order to drill and complete these much more critical wells and get into a lot deeper wells. Once, we've, once we're satisfied with the testing and the design of our new product, we want to be able to launch our new D4 and be able to take on a lot more of that obtainable market. So, so with some of our preliminary research, we found that the average downtime for a well can cost anywhere between $1.5 and $2 million. So we think that by implementing the D4, if we can cut that non-productive time down in half by 50%, then we can create savings of $1.1 million per well drilled. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, you, we'll take them now. Thank you, D4. All right, judges, you've got five minutes for questions. I have a question. Uh, idea is very, very good. But pro my problem is the parameter you can control is mostly on the rig, not downfall. What kind of parameter? O only parameter you can control is uh, maybe ROP or something. But even ROP, most of the rig system at this moment is controlled by rig side, not downfall. So what are you going to do with that? Okay. 
so you're right. Uh, the parameters we can control are from the surface. The RPM, weight on weight, all these things. So here we are not trying to control at the bit any variable at the bit. So all we are trying to do is eliminate the processing that is happening uh, at the surface, which is causing the delays. Because any driller, uh, it, he takes some time, he or she takes some time to process the data, analyze it, and the decision he takes depends on his expertise or knowledge. So eliminating this and automating the process uh, by having the processor at the bit, we are directly sending the controls back to the surface, the decision already taken by the processor to the surface. And the control is again from the surface, that we cannot change that. Okay. Yeah. So just to add on to that, yes. just to please explain, but so if, if I'm drilling away and I I see uh, weight on bit starts to go up a little bit, I'm torquing up, your system would then automatically feed that information and adjust parameters, maybe back off weight on bit mm -hmm. yes. because of the situation it's seeing yes. down hole, as opposed to relying on the driller to, to interpret and do it. Yes, yes exactly. but the driller right. would have the opportunity to intervene and oversee override. the process. Anything. Okay, so he can override it anytime. Yes. Okay. And then my next question was um, around the average cost of downtime that, that you guys did. Was that based off a downhole event? Uh, uh, so this data is from a couple of publications uh, for offshore wells in the Gulf of Mexico. These are the typical numbers. And based on that, as, we, as Connor talked, uh, we expect to reduce the non-productive time at least by 50%. That's a conservative estimate, I believe. So it, uh, by Reducing the NPT by 50%, those are the numbers. In terms of the hardware you're actually putting down hole itself, um, it, it looks like you're burying those behind the threads of the pipe, correct? Yes. The, of the bit. Um, what kind of heat and basically physical torsion um, parameters did you put on that device to make sure that it can withstand it? Um, well, our material selection is going to mostly depend on the service. We don't want to put an un incompatible metal with, say, like a drill bit or a bit sub. So that's going to be one of our biggest driving factors. Other than that, we feel that we've sized our design correctly to protect our sensitive computer, our sensitive microcontroller from that. And then again, in terms of like um, the harsh environment that this will be placed into, we feel that by having threads on both the um, the top and bottom of where we actually store our components, if we were to adequately dope this. Um, Dope, I mean like adding something s similar to like Loctite. If we were to adequately dope the thread before installing this, I think we could protect our computers and our sensors pretty adequately. Just clarify, this is not at the end of the tool. And one more thing, are you guys size limited as far as what, what hole sizes you could drill or? Is right now, to all hole sizes? Right now we are size limited. Our initial prototype isn't that um, small, but uh, like I said, in our uh, future business plans, we hope to be able to do some research and development, maybe get a microcontroller that is more suited directly for our application so that we can minimize the essentially real estate that we're taking up within the bottom hole assemblies. Yeah, okay, yeah, your most, your most critical hole sections are going to be your smaller hole sizes, so working mm -hmm. towards something that's... Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. Any other questions? All right, D4, thank you so much for your presentation. Appreciate it. The next team is going to be Outlet.
And now we present Team Outlet. Howdy. I'm Arushi Pato, and I'm a master's student in electrical engineering. Hi, I'm Rebuk Tahan, and I'm double majoring in nuclear engineering and physics. Hi, I'm Jack Tribolet. I'm a freshman engineering major. Hi, I'm William Teeley. I'm a mechanical engineering major. Hi, I'm Jordan Lloyd, and I'm a general engineering major. I'm Ryan Jalta, and I'm a junior electrical engineer. And we are Team Outlet. <clears throat> Before we begin, we would like to show you a short video. The world wastes more energy than it uses every year. 1.2 billion people have little to no access to electricity. However, we're getting better and better at producing more renewable energy for less. Although we continue to find new ways to increase solar and wind energy's efficiency, a lot of energy produced is wasted. As the sun shines brightly when least needed, retreating beyond the horizon before peak consumption times, and the direction of the wind is unpredictable, but there's no comprehensive grid system to make up for it. Due to this erratic production and limitations to current battery technology, we have no proper way of storing renewable energy. But what if we could change that? Our company, Outlet, has come up with a solution. A battery, but not just of any kind. It's a battery which stores energy as hydropotential energy, thus holding the energy indefinitely. It can charge during peak hours of energy production and discharge during peak hours of energy consumption. We call it the Aqua Dome. So join us, Team Outlet, in providing ways for making renewable energy available around the clock. Our company, aims at providing a means of storing renewable energy 24 hours a day. Already we've been working, we've been doing miraculous works in acquiring uh, energy from renewable resources. However, the power output is volatile. The reason being the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow as and when needed. So we need to come up with a product as a, ways of, as a means of storing it so that we can utilize it indefinitely. Keeping that in mind, we had to come up with a certain number of design requirements. Okay, so here are our five uh, requirements that our product will need to satisfy. The first one is supply power when needed. The second one is it should be scaling. So we can uh, uh, basically put multiple of the system and connect them to grid when needed. Third, it should be economical. So it should be cheaper than other energy storage methods available. It should be efficient, and finally, it should be sustainable. So whichever ecosystem we deploy it in, it does not destroy it. So uh, based on this requirement, we came up with three different uh, solutions. The first one was space-based solar array. Now, uh, the problem with that we found with that is that launch costs currently are extremely high, and this uh, is not viable. But as in the future, long launch costs fall down, this can be a viable option. The second uh, idea that we came up with was a reservoir pump storage. So basically, uh, in reservoir pump storage, we store potential energy of water by evaporating that and putting it at a high, high potential. Now we can tap uh, that potential energy out whenever needed by using regular hydro turbines. And finally, number three, uh, the, our solution was Aquadome. And that is what we uh, are proposing today. So Aquadome, basically, are uh, concrete bunkers, dome shaped, which can be submerged deep inside uh, any water body and it's listed on the bed of the water body. Now, in, in the initial state, they're filled with water and they're connected to the grid as well. So, whenever we have high uh, or when we have excess energy, then we can pump water out of this uh, aquadome and store the energy, electrical energy, in terms of pressure energy. Now, whenever we uh, need more energy in terms of in, in peak times, then we can uh, gush water into this uh, aquadome, rotating a turbine, converting that pressure energy back into the electrical energy. Now, this is a very low-tech uh, problem for a high-tech, uh, low-tech solution for a high-tech problem. To demonstrate the proof of concept, we developed this prototype out of basic materials, basically PVC hot glue and a computer fan, to simulate 
a valve, a turbine, and a storage container. If you open the valve and submerge it in water, it fills up and spins the turbine. However, when you blow air through it or pump the water out, and then you seal it off, I opened it. <laughs> um, the system creates a vacuum, which can then or be used again in the future. The total product, uh, sorry, the pr total prototype cost was about sixty dollars to replicate. So the uh, the structure is going to be composed of mostly concrete. Uh, we're using Type Five cement for that because it's the most resilient to saltwater corrosion and because it's the most eco-friendly. You know, we're putting these in the ocean or bodies of water in general. Um, it withstands up to 141, or sorry, it can withstand 142 PSI uh, at 100 meters below on the uh, 100 meters ocean depth, uh, which, and it actually, sorry, it's got, uh, it can go up to a, a, over 1,000 PSI, which uh, we had research where we found research that uh, showed that structures of the same geometry can withstand similar if not greater pressures. Um, then we're going to have a variable, variable output turbine. Uh, it's going to be able to meet the required demand, whatever that may be, if it's like a peak um, or if we need like a longer duration, we'll adjust the flow rate by uh, adjusting the size of the valve. Uh, next we have the air pump. It's going to be a high pressure centrifugal pump just to pump the water out. That's our product is going to have a 20 year lifespan along with being eco friendly. And this means that you can leave it at the bottom of a waterbed for an indefinite period of time without harmful effects on the environment that surrounds it. Each one is going to be equipped with software programs that monitors flow rate and its diagnostics in order to ensure optimum efficiency. And, pre and repairs are going to be performed by automated submerged robots, which uh, current Norwegian company is working on as we speak. <clears throat> so bottom line, this product saves 15 to 22 percent of the excess energy that would have been completely wasted and then utilizes it during the peak hours. Now assuming an investment for each dome, taking in all the parts that we need, it will cost about 20, 20 to 30 thousand each dome. However, after 10 years, it is expected for you to make that back. So knowing the 20 year lifespan, that means the investment will double. So on a broader scale, how to implement this further, what we'd like to do is research if we can find any even less expensive and better materials to maybe scale this up and maybe have even more than one on each wind turbine as well as the market we'll be looking for, of course, we're going to start at uh, offshore wind turbines, since they are very volatile, high cost, and if we can raise their efficiency, we're going to raise the prop, 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 profit margin much higher. After that, we can then span further onto other, uh, other places where it's just any renewable source or any vol volatile source of power with a large body of water where we can place these. As stated, demonstrated, and tested by my fellow colleagues, our company's product is serving to be helpful because, number one, it makes money. Number two, it improves the environment by satisfying the design requirements. And number three, it solves our problem statement by providing a means to store 20, uh, renewable energy 24 hours a day indefinitely. So join us, Team Outlet, in creating a sustainable future. Thanks and giggle. Thank you very much, Alan. Judges, you have five minutes for questions. What would a standard implementation of this look like? How many kilowatt hours would you have to have okay. to produce and, and so what size? How, how much cost? From our design, which was about uh, 20, uh, 40 feet in diameter, a dome of 40 feet in diameter, 20 feet high, you can, you can store 100 kilowatt hours of energy in one dome alone. And if you, if you are 
uh, uh, basically deploying multiple of this, uh, you can increase the power significantly. Also, this costs uh, pretty much nothing compared to wind turbines. Like wind turbines uh, cost uh, uh, around a million, million to two million dollars, while this costs twenty to thirty thousand dollars. So, and the amount of power they save is, uh, is significant. So, uh, in, in long term, they're going to make you money. Who would you pitch this to, to buy it? Mainly European companies. Um, America is kind of behind on offshore drilling, so to start out, we would probably pitch this in some sort of uh, European setting and then expand from there. And who within that European setting? That would be, there was a, I believe it was Nexus, was one of the offshore um, con contractors. There were a few that uh, just got permits as well in America, but I'm not sure. <coughs> to add on that, uh, these are not only for offshore wind, wind turbines. We can put them in any water bodies and connect them to grid. So whenever we have excess power in the grid, we can store them as water potential. All right, judges, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dean Allen. All right, the cold ones. Hello, I'm Henry Deal, a freshman general engineer. Uh, Clayton Christensen, freshman general engineering student. Marlon Olivares, senior industrial engineer. Jonathan Paulos, junior electrical engineering student. I'm Alex Schiller, I'm a freshman general engineering student. Jason Tabadan, senior nuclear engineering. And we are the cold ones, or TCO for short. What if you were in a developing country without enough power to keep your food fresh for more than a day? What if you could not provide medicine to your children because it has been damaged by the scorching heat? People in newly developing countries struggle every day to store food and medicine. This is a major problem. Bacteria is everywhere, and without healthy refrigeration, it will spread rapidly. The USDA states that food held at temperatures above 5 degrees Celsius for more than two hours should not be consumed. Foodborne illnesses caused by improper food handling leads to 125,000 deaths every year, according to the World Health Organization. 40% of children under the age of 5 carry a foodborne illness. Diabetic patients rely on insulin, which has to be stored in under 4 degrees Celsius. 285 million people suffer from diabetes two-thirds of which live in low-income countries. We need a solution now. TCO has begun to work on the answer. 
we have developed a refrigerating system that will allow families to maintain their refrigeration needs 24 hours per day without requiring electricity. With the use of compression refrigeration and evaporation cooling, unreliable electricity is no longer a problem. While the electricity is running smoothly, the compression refrigeration is kicking back and acting as a basic functioning refrigerator. Once the power goes out, all that is required is for the user to pour a little bit of water into the auxiliary cooling system and the refrigerator is back in action. Our mission this weekend was to create a refrigeration solution that could be easily implemented in a developing country without a reliable power grid. So our solution had five different design requirements. Our first and most important design requirement was that it had to be less than or equal to $60. This is, be this is because our target consumers were, were consumers from developing countries that do not have the luxury of affording large and expensive fridges. Our second design requirement was that it had to be between 35 and 40 degrees Fahrenheit. This is because that's the average temperature of a fridge. Our third design requirement was that it had to be below the size of eight, eight cubic feet. This is because we wanted to make it compact and very accessible to our consumers. Our fourth design requirement was that it had to be capable of containing medicine and food, which can be preserved for weeks. Our fifth design requirement is that it should be able to work without electricity for a minimum of 24 hours. And this is because our, our uh, audience, our uh, consumers uh, from developing countries do not have a reliable electricity source to provide them with a consistent power, power grid uh, daily and throughout the week. And before going into the design alternatives, I'm going to talk a little bit of what is a sear pot. A sear pot, uh, in simplistic terms, is going to be a pot inside another pot and with sand in between. Once you pour a little bit of water in the sand, uh, it starts a, a phenomenon that is called evaporating cooling. So it basically brings uh, the hot air and transforms it into cool air. So with that being said, I'm going to talk about our first uh, design that we initially thought of, talked about. It's going to be a, a combination of a sear pot and a knife machine. So what we thought initially was that the ice can keep the uh, refrigerated area cold. And in case of uh, an electricity outage, uh, the ice will then melt and then pour into the, the sand deposit, uh, starting the uh, evaporation cooling. However, this uh, was not uh, really reliable because it would require a lot of uh, ice and a lot of electricity. Uh, then we uh, move on, on to another design. We thought, uh, we thought of a design that would not require any electricity at all. So how, how could we achieve that? It will be implementing a dog, uh, ventilation duct uh, to reduce humidity and increase the transformation of, of hot air to cold air. Uh, however, to make it run without electricity, uh, we were uh, thinking into um, powering the turbines with a pulley system. And this will make the, the design a little bit uh, bigger and it will require for the main. Our team's final product um, is it's right here. And it is a three wall auxiliary system. What it actually is, is this is the bridge on the side and it's at a scale of about one half. Um, starting from the base, it's where the actual refrigerator unit, storage unit would be, surrounded by clay, surrounded by where the storage of the sand would be, surrounded by one more layer of clay. And so that's actually the zero pot method that uh, Marlon just explained in the last slide. Right outside of that, there's one more air filter gap to allow for uh, two fans that actually allow airflow so that the zero pot method can be at its highest efficient rate so that it can maintain the two to five degrees Celsius for the second requirement that we have. On the very outside, the refrigerator is surrounded by wood because for the zero pot method to work, it needs to have a porous material so that the evaporation cooling can continue to bring warm air in and therefore bring the cool air inside of the actual refrigerator. Um, on top right here, there's a compartment for the refrigerator compressor and also a battery. The battery will be continuously charging while the developing country's electric grid is powered and the second that it goes off, the battery will be charging or powering the fans so that the airflow can be consistent with the zero pot method. On top is a one layer of polyurethane as an insulator and on top of that would be the coils for the actual compression refrigeration so that the heating can leave correctly without heating up the inside of the fridge. Uh, secondly, 
We need to make sure that the lid will maintain the two to five degrees Celsius. And so if we were to use a normal lid on a refrigerator, what would end up happening is because lids use electromagnets, when the electricity goes out, the fridge is gonna open again and then we're gonna lose all of the temperature that we just maintained. So in order to fix this, we have a, we have a suction lid using an elastic compression. So you press it down and such as a Yeti mug, you would pull it back up and it maintains all of the temperature as before. Uh, so our device uses two uh, cooling systems, one being the, the deer pot, which is uh, where the developing countries are already familiar with, so there's no new technology for them to learn. It's easy for them to use. And then we have a uh, traditional fridge cooling system where the zero pot will be inside. Also, it's also eco-friendly because it uses sand and soil, something that's already in developing countries. And if you ever need to dispose of it, it won't create more waste compared to a traditional fridge. So not only does our product solve the problem of providing reliable refrigeration in areas without reliable power, but it also does so at an affordable price. So we're planning on selling this for about $60, and our cost to produce is based on off-the-shelf prices, so this would go down using industrial mass production processes. Uh, it would be about $43 to produce, giving us a profit of about $17, which again, we're expecting to increase. And also, according to a study by Nation Master done in 2014, they determined that the average monthly disposable income for most of the world's developing countries is well above $60 a month. So that would indicate that people in those countries can actually afford to purchase one of these devices. That would be then used to give them reliable refrigeration for, uh, without, without, the without needing to have the power. So, and as well, the $60 that we'd be selling this for is much lower than the average cost of a mini refrigerator at $50, sorry, at $150. So it's, it's about 60% cheaper and it is more reliable as well. And uh, thank you for your time. And uh, if you have any questions, we'll take them now. Thank you, Cold Ones. Thank you very much. And judges, you have five minutes for questions. So I'm curious, one of your design criterion was that it had to maintain its temperature for 24 hours. Was that based on research that suggested that the average power unreliability or outage was less than 24 hours for these areas? Or, so or did you randomly just pick 24 it was, hours? It was based on the need statement that we went through where the electricity has to be, or it's unreliable within a 24 hour period. And then also there tends to be 14 hour to 20 hour power outages. And based on how developing countries are now, they need food, and we have to make sure that the fridge can actually support and contain the food that they have. Well, cold ones, it looks like you nailed it. Thank you very much. And finally, uh, Waste Not. That'll be our last team for the evening. So Waste Not, if y'all will come forward. And the final team this evening is Waste Not. Howdy, we are Waste Not, and I'm Aaron Keane, senior industrial engineering student. 
For this project, I contributed to research and construction of 3D prototype. Howdy, my name is Dr. Lindo. I'm a freshman in general engineering, and I contributed in the video editing and the presentation. Hi, I'm Luke Cantrell. I'm a senior nuclear engineering student. I helped with the presentation and some research. Hi, I'm Jonas Stites. I'm a freshman in general engineering, and I designed the product and helped in constructing a prototype. Hi, I'm Abdel Harhash. I helped design with uh, the uh, prototype and I did the video. I'm a biomedical engineer. I'm a sophomore. Hi, my name is Vivek Tengudu. I'm a junior industrial engineering student, and I contributed to the research and the video for the project. Currently, the world is facing a huge crisis that more than one third of the food waste How often have you seen uneaten food thrown in the trash can? Now think about a restaurant. Throughout one year, a restaurant produces approximately 25,000 to 75,000 pounds of food waste. Where does all this food go? In garbage trucks on the way to landfills for combustion. Not a great system for the restaurants or the ecosystem, is it? That's where Waste Knots Digester comes in. Waste Knots Digester is a state-of-the-art biodigester using fermentation to produce natural gas and nutrient-rich compost. Not only are you saving operational costs of your restaurant with reduced garbage fees, but you're also providing gas to your own oven for free. Now with all this recycled waste, you can make an impact from your local restaurant. It contributes to waste and as well as expenses for a restaurant. In other words, what's the key takeaway? Restaurants can and should develop new solutions for reusing waste. So let me set the scene for you. Restaurants pack and trash food that's uneaten every day. What's the result? $200 a week in terms of trash and trash disposal, one, one ton a week of excess waste, and the result? 35 million tons of reusable, possibly reusable, bio waste that, that's, land, that's landed in the landfill. Our solution serves to fix, this, serves to fix the problem of bio waste from a restaurant. And now I'll, now I'll pass it over to Abdel to discuss the design requirements for our solution. So the five design requirements for our solution are, uh, so first of all, we have to reduce the amount of uh, space taken up by the waste. Uh, and by, we have to do that by 50%. And next, we have to um, uh, convert the amount of uh, waste, food waste, into uh, methane. And we have to do that in a reasonable amount of time. Also, next up, and the most important one, uh, we have to uh, include the size, uh, indicate the size uh, for every for every American restaurant. Next up, we have uh, we have to make sure this device is very uh, user friendly, and uh, to do that, we have we we make sure it's uh, it takes less than 30 minutes every week for maintenance, and finally, it's economically viable. Now I'll give it to Jonas, and he'll talk about the. Our first design, our first design implemented a process of decomposing and processing food waste in a rich oxygen environment using bacteria in order to remove all of the carbon from that said waste. However, there was already a product in the market that supplied this niche and it also failed to reduce the amount of carbon or the amount of oxygen that was present in the food waste. And so the second design that we came up with involved processing food waste in an environment that was lacking in oxygen in order to pull oxygen out of the food waste. However, this took a relatively long time to the original design, and it also failed to remove as much carbon as the first design did from the actual food waste. And so our final design was a resulting hybrid system of the two processes in order to maximize the amount of carbon and oxygen removed 
from the food waste and minimize the amount of remaining organic matter after the process has been finished. And so after you supply the digester with food waste, and it runs its process of digest digestion, you will just be left with a nitrogen and phosphorus rich fertilizer, as well as natural gas from the decomposition. The maintenance requirements for this device are only to not supply it with new food waste more often than once every 12 hours, and to empty its solid waste chamber at least once a week. I will pass on to Luke to further assess this product. So how does our product assist in making that waste process better? Well, when you take the food and you put it into the system, what you do is you essentially reduce it by 70%. That reduces the total waste that the restaurants will need to ship off and effectively saves them $10,000 every year on that shipping cost. In addition, our product produces two byproducts. It produces, uh, it produces methane and uh, produces methane and compost. This methane can then be used as natural as a resource to be pumped into the restaurant, and then used to fuel stoves, ovens, and other uh, cooking equipment. This alone will help save the restaurants about four hundred dollars throughout the year. The compost can then be taken by the waste not team and used and then sold and used as fertilizer to other consumers. Now this allows us to take the waste from the restaurants so that they don't have to deal with that waste themselves and then we can profit off of that selling of that waste. Now based on our estimates for the cost of the, uh, of the product, it will be about $20,000 for a single unit. This means that within a two year period we should be able to, that product will be able to recoup its cost for the restaurant. Now Alexis will talk about our future um, future aspects for Waste Not. Yes, so as Luke mentioned, the design actually leaves behind some compost and we as a Waste Not team would want to create a um, centralized uh, startup company which would collect that compost and we would sell it off to other consumers such as farmers. And also as time would go on, we would like to implement new technology into our design to optimize it and make it more efficient and we would also like to create more varying model sizes that we could implement into different establishments such as schools, hospitals, cafeterias, and the average American home. Um, and last, um, the lasting effect about uh, with that would be that we reduce the, um, the amount of waste that goes into landfills and it's very eco-friendly. Finer note, we are Waste Not, where we, we give, give waste, waste a purpose. purpose. Thank you for your time and we Love to answer your question. Thank you very much, Waste Not. <laughs> Judges, you have five minutes for questions. Hello. How do you handle like a bones or fish bones or all this, you know, solid waste? You can, re you can remove it or just together you remove it or what? It would be ideal to remove most solid waste because the bacteria aren't actually able to digest it in our specific one, but we could implement new biological processes in a different design that could synthesize and process more defined and heavy biological parts. And then to add on to that, the current design doesn't prevent the system from working if there are solid waste in there that can't be disposed of, it just goes through without being converted in, to anything useful. Have you thought about what target, you know, customer pool you'd be looking at in terms of the restaurants? Yes. So initially we were thinking just general restaurants, but thinking about more, it probably have to start off with higher end restaurants, and then as it gets more accustomed and we produce more products that are tailored to specific restaurants, we can expand to smaller restaurants, and then further on we can target uh, cafeterias, hospitals, larger areas, or larger uh, markets. Yeah, because you're going to have to find restaurants that would be actually motivated to pay for this and use it. Mm -hmm. So I think without regulatory, regulatory requirements, it, you might want to think about those companies where that 
really matters to them. And then the, they should be able to recoup their costs within the two year period and we expect it to run for five to 10 years. So that alone should be, we were hoping it's into So did y'all run any calculations about how much methane you could generate based on a standard input um, so that we can tell if the feasibility of running a stove or something else off that methane is actually practical? Yes, we did review a book made by Thomas House over anaerobic decomposition, and they said given a general organic blend of food products, the carbon in those will be the limiting factor for how much methane the bacteria can produce, which can be up to about 50% of the original biomass's weight can be fully converted into methane. Explain your revenue streams again to me. So for our, for our products just on, on our end, okay, so we will be selling the product. Sorry, we'll be selling the product to the consumers, the restaurants. Uh, in addition to that, we will be, we intend to take the garbage, the remaining compost away from the restaurants ourselves and be able to sell that off uh, to people who are interested in fertilizing, using that for fertilizer. So it's essentially two sources. Um, and then further on, we are expect, or we are looking into centralizing that, potentially creating a single source um, where we could put it all in one batch, essentially. So there's things that we can think about and expand on that. But so that's our I heard I heard three: the product, yes, the removal, yes, and then the re remanufacture and resell of the the actual compost, compost right? Mm -hmm. Well, can we intend to do the removal for free, essentially, to take it off the hands of the uh, the restaurants, and that will be you know the, how we get the third. The fourth is so. maintenance, by the way. Uh, oh yes, that's there you go. Thank also, you. that onto that. So, whenever we're looking at the goal for for, for waste management, we're looking at the, the biggest the biggest source of waste, and that that starts at restaurants. So that's where we found the data on how there's one ton of weekly uh, food wastage. Right. So that's why that's why the beginning of our, our of our revenue stream would be at a restaurant. But whenever we're looking into different sizes or how we can scale up our, our design, then it, it'll it'll go more into cafeterias. Or it'll go more into maybe a bigger restaurant. But the start is going to be for the restaurant. Did you did you ever speak the size of the unit? Um, in our design, we did. It will be about 51 inches tall in order to be accessible by any employee user, and it will have the same width. It's meant to be able to substitute or replace a traditional restaurant dumpster or fit in the same space as a normal kitchen large appliance in order to not be a convenience for a restaurant's real estate. Okay, and thank you very much. Uh, without any further time to waste, sorry about the time. We will be back in just a few minutes to award the winners. For those of you who are here, I would like all of your prototypes to be placed on the table back there. We'll keep them safe for you throughout the rest of the time, and that way, if you'd like to continue on, uh, we'll have your prototypes for you. I'd like to also remind you that as part of engineering entrepreneurship, you're ready to continue on and develop this into a commercial, uh, commercial product. We are here to help you. Thank you very much. We will be back in just a few minutes. One of the things, participants, if you'll go right outside on the steps, just up, up as you were going towards Starbucks, we'll take a group shot. So if everybody will proceed over there, we would appreciate that to take a group shot. Thank you very much.
Okay, howdy. We are now back uh, from having a deliberation with the judges and getting a chance to really discuss what the different projects were. It was very interesting to see all of your projects. And I also was very impressed with the different work and how you progressed from your first briefing Friday night to your presentations today. Really tremendous effort on every one of the teams and you grew tremendously throughout the entire weekend. So I really, really enjoyed watching y'all and helping you go through the various projects. Again, my name is Rodney Bain. We're responsible for engineering entrepreneurship. And those of you who would like to continue on, we want to encourage you to continue on and get in touch with us and work with us. I will remind you also, the students who, uh, the teams that I'm about to announce, uh, first, second, and third place, we will place the money in your student account as scholarships. That's how you'll see the money as it comes into scholarships. And you'll be handing, you'll be getting great big blue checks. I need those checks back. <laughs> we recycle them and we use them again the next time. The next uh, Aggies in Bed uh, will be held in next month. It's going to be in November, and it will be with uh, Special Operations Command, so we'll be designing things for our Special Forces, as well as Army Futures Command. So that's the upcoming Aggies in Bend. Thank you again for all your time, attention, and effort, and please, uh, please help us by making sure you turned in all the equipment back into the EDC and help us by um, making sure that this room is tidy as you leave. All right, we're gonna have the folks from Accenture to come up and, and award the third place award to the uh, team, the third place team. And the third place team is Gas Finders. can keep that check for a little while and take your pictures with it, but I just want it back before you leave, all right? Not cashable, not redeemable, sorry. All right, and we're going to have the folks from British BP come up and uh, present the second award. BP was one of the sponsors of the event, so we really, really appreciate that. And the second place team is Lux Energy. And finally, the one you've been waiting for, the College of Engineering is also a major sponsor of this particular one. And let's turn it over correctly. And the first place award is $1,000 goes to Power Protected. Y'all get in the middle. Congratulations, congratulations, congratulations. You bet, congratulations, congratulations. You bet. All right, get in the middle. Move over. Obey the, obey the young lady with the camera. Okay, here we go. All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much for all your weekend. We really appreciate everybody here, particularly all the sponsors, the mentors, and the judges and also our outstanding staff who be able, who's able to keep the entire weekend running. So if y'all don't mind, give our staff a great big round of applause. Thank you very much. And have a great weekend, and don't forget school starts tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock.